Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to Read Becca for a weekly chatty catch up on everything that I read, everything I'm currently reading, and everything I'm looking forward to reading for about this week, as well as some general chit chat. So I finally am out of the cave. I'm back to reading again properly. I've been struggling a lot with reading lately, though I didn't have a massive slowdown. I kept things going, uh, but I'm very happy to finally be really progressing in my reading and, and not struggling every time I sit down to read. So I did read a good amount as a result. And first off, I read Mutual Rescue, How Adopting a Homeless Animal Can Save You Too by Carol Novello with Ginny Graves. And this I had intended for my nonfiction browsing goal for this year, where monthly I just go browse and pick up something that is calling to me from the nonfiction shelves at the library. But I also think this very much fits for April, April um, a focused event this month on reading books focused on the stories of individual people. I hadn't intended it that way, but it very much is that. So this is a book that's all about individual accounts, personal stories of people who are going through really severe struggles and had an animal enter their lives at the time that they needed and make a huge impact on them, turn things around in a very positive way. So this book is is really full of very, very hard stories to hear, but I think it focuses the hope and really centers that so well that I, I didn't become emotionally affected to the negative more so than the positive. So I think this had the right centering. But be aware going in, this is absolutely full of people who are struggling with physical and mental disabilities or issues that they're trying to get through, uh, general health issues that come on suddenly, people who are dealing with trauma and grief are all through this. Um, as well, there, there's a chapter on things like addiction, people struggling with that and and being assisted or having the incentive to turn their lives around because of an animal who entered their life. So many of these are adoption stories. Some of them are strays who found their way into these people's lives completely accidentally. But what's so wonderful about this is that it does focus those personal individual accounts while also peppering through facts and data about how important animals are in our lives or can be. Um, so very quickly, I don't want to dive into too much statistics or anything, but, but this I think sums up kind of the intent and purpose of the book very well. Cats can't cure cancer and dogs can't treat seizures, but they can in many cases improve chronically ill or injured people's ability to function, keep them safe, ease their suffering, and allow them to participate more fully in life. And the list of conditions animals might be able to help with just keeps growing, from post-op recovery to seizure disorders and Parkinson's to cancer, diabetes, and AIDS. The specific roles that animals play are just as diverse. Nurse, helpmate, protector, fitness partner, cheerleader, and emotional support, guardian, friend. One study found that cat owners have a 30% lower risk of heart attack compared to non-cat owners, probably because they help reduce stress and blood pressure. Another that looked at nearly 4,000 people age 50 and older found that women who owned a cat had significantly lower risk of dying of a cardiovascular related event, particularly a stroke, than non-cat owners. And it goes on with, with similar data packed throughout this on how animals can improve and enrich our lives. And I found that so so touching, so moving, so informative. And so this was a, just a great book for me. Obviously, this is an area that I, I really have a heart for. I am a perpetual uh, animal lover through my whole life and a current foster. In fact, we will have an aside right now, I guess, for <laughs> because, of course, my life has not been chaotic enough lately. Uh, things were finally subsiding, so I decided to take in a foster. So. Here, I will show you my lovely foster, Dusty. He is someone who came into the shelter and has been not doing well there. And he was over grooming to the point that he had made quite raw and injured spots on his body. Um, he had been somebody's house cat, very clearly. He's super friendly and amicable. Uh, he doesn't seem to understand cat behavior at all. <laughs> like he's supposed to be timid and he's not. And he just was not doing well at the shelter. And I saw him come in available to foster while I was dealing with having my kitchen renovated um, and couldn't take him at the time and then saw he wasn't picked up. And they've been great like the past several months. We've had almost no fosters go without going to a home. And so he, he kind of sat and sat and finally with my kitchen finishing up recently, I decided I'm gonna reach out and see if he still hasn't found a foster and he had not. So he is he's out with me. He's healing up very well already and he is so sweet. He's kind of got a dog personality. He wants to just lay by my feet while I work all day. If he were able to wander around the house, which he, he probably will be eventually, 
Um, he would just follow on my heels all day. I think he would be my shadow. So we're getting to know him and it's gonna be a, a process, I think, to get him incorporated with my cats because he's so unaware of cat etiquette at all. Um, so that's gonna take some time, I think, but he's doing really, really well and he's so sweet. So anyway, uh, back to the books. That was Mutual Rescue. I enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, the next one is Almost American Girl by Robin Ha. This is a graphic memoir. So this definitely was for people April intentionally. I wanted to pick up a couple graphic memoirs and this is a, a YA graphic memoir. So for me, I would say that's kind of the downfall. Like, I just wasn't the audience for this. So it was okay, but it was not a standout for me. I think this was very much intending and appealing to things that teens would need to hear. And mainly it's very focused on her experiences as someone who was not really in control of her life as a young person and coming to understand later after the fact why things were happening negatively in her perception to her. So this accounts her childhood initially in Korea and eventual move to America with her mother. She deals with so much bullying and mistreatment over the course of her life because she's being raised by a single mother who's financially supporting both of them. And that's very frowned upon. There's a lot about the cultural differences throughout this. So I think that was laid out very well. And then when she gets to America, she's dealing with a lot of cultural and ethnic based bullying. So it certainly focuses on those aspects of the mistreatment of her and how that, that wasn't really about her or anything she had done at all. And I think, unfortunately, it did very strongly center those aspects, the really negative things she had experienced in her life, without entirely going deeper into that as a, a kind of bigger topic other than just her personal account. And I, I kind of wish that had been there. Um, but it did also come around to her finding her place and finding joy in comics and finding a community really through comics in the US. Um, so I think that that was the hopeful aspect where as she was coming into her teens, she, she did finally find that path forward and find acceptance in the world that she was living in. Found a happy, um, communicative relationship with her mom after years of kind of struggling, even though they were each other's rocks through a lot of things that they went through and difficulties. And so I think this was great for a teen audience. For me, I don't think this was going to be super memorable because as a memoir, it felt like it jumped around a little bit and even to the, the bullying point, I felt like we were talking about her being bullied in America and then it jumped back to show how she was being bullied in the past. But yet she, she got out of that being bullied in the past in Korea and came to have friends and whatnot. And it didn't quite draw the conclusion for the reader, for this young reader who's, who's reading this, that, that yeah, eventually things will get better. You will make friends, you know? Um, so I wish it had more overtly, I think, spelled that out for a young reader audience. And I do think probably this is geared toward the younger end of YA. Um, but the art was fantastic. I really, really loved the art. I loved the way that she sort of portrayed her feelings of being an outcast in the art and um, not any specific technique, but she just, she just always seems isolated in the picture at times. And I, I felt that through, through the picture. So I think this was a very good one, but yeah, not super memorable for me. Uh, then I read a couple of children's books for the picture of this readathon. First up, I read The Most Beautiful Story by Reinald Young Chan and Oyvind Torster, translated from the Norwegian by Kari Dixon. And you can see I kind of picked it up because of the cover, and I love reading translated children's stories, <laughs> but this was a bit of a mixed bag. I did really like the art, but I'm not so sure about the story. The story was a little strange. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna completely spoil the story here. Uh, she, this, this girl, you can probably barely see her because she very often is there in just simple pencil sketches. She in the night wakes up um, and, or kind of almost sleepwalks to this lake. And uh, oddly she has her potentially dead baby brother in her hair carried along with her to the lake. And the lake, a, a spirit sort of thing raises out of the lake and sort of tells this wonderful story and helps bring the boy back to life temporarily. <laughs> I'm not sure I totally understood it. It was a little dark and strange. Um, but also there, there was this sort of like the reinvigoration of the natural world to it possibly. I don't know, but I did very much like the art. So that one doesn't have a lot going for it, unfortunately. I, I'm not sure I quite got it. 
but then much more successfully for me was Aquacorn Co by Kay O'Neill. This is the author of the Tea Dragon Society, a perennial favorite, and so I when I saw it on the shelves while I was browsing for picture of this readathon stuff, I had to, um, yeah, I had to pick it up. And this is such a, a great story, but it also falls into some of the, the pitfalls of the Tea Dragon Society books. Um, so in this story, we're, we're following a young girl who, she, she at the beginning <laughs> is there at the beach cleaning up after a storm. Um, her and her father are sort of visiting, visiting from out of town, come to help her aunt do this cleanup. Their whole small village on the coast has been really damaged constantly by storms and they're not doing well. It seems like their village isn't gonna be able to support itself for, for some time. And so there's a lot there about the, the struggles of a small community and climate change, natural disasters happening and affecting them. And then we sort of have a digression. So I think this happened in the second Tea Dragon Society book and kind of breaks the flow of things because we jump back in time to see her losing her mother. Her mother has, has died, the grief over that and kind of coming back and healing from that, as well as her aunt making a connection with this undersea society. Um, so, so how all of that connects is that during the cleanup at the beginning, our, our young girl character found an aqua corn in one of the tide pools trapped and so takes it home and much like tea dragons in society she talks to her aunt to kind of find out how to care for it and her aunt knows because she went to this under undersea city um, or yeah she made connections with a community who live under the sea and so much about this does really tie into connection with nature and climate change um, it's a little bit heavy-handed perhaps i thought it was fine for for a young audience but it very definitely is talking about things like damage to coral reefs under the sea and having that balance with nature in how we use natural resources. So those are very prominent to this. But I just love Kay O'Neill's work. And so even with the couple wobbles of this that, that break the flow a little bit or were heavy handed, I still really love this and found it very delightful. And the art is, as always, chef's kiss with Kay O'Neill. You, I think Kay O'Neill could just do art books and, and I would be fully on board. So this was a fun one. Um, it was not my favorite of Kay O'Neill's work, but it was great. And that is everything that I finished this week. In progress, I still have very much the same. I'm working on Scribbles, Sorrows, and Russet Leather Boots, The Life of Louisa May Alcott by Liz Rosenberg for Alcott April, The City in the Middle of the Night by Charlie Jane Anders for Transgirl April, and Life on Other Planets, a memoir of finding my place in the universe by Oomawa Shields uh, for People April as well. So I think those are everything that I've got in progress. I did watch something this week. I watched The Taste, season one, on Prime which is a cooking competition show that I somehow missed in the mid 2010s, I think. And it has the host or judges, hosts, mentors, uh, Ludo Lefebvre, Nigella Lawson, and Anthony Bourdain. Of course, I love Anthony Bourdain. We talked about him earlier this month with my rereading Kitchen Confidential. I don't, I don't know how I missed this, but it's a great, great show. And the whole premise is so smart because the taste is a spoonful and the competitors are on selected for teams by each mentor and then they individually have to make a entire meal in one spoon it's like a little amuse bouche spoon um but the mentors are both mentoring and judging blind what's on their spoons so they don't know if they're judging against one of their own team members and i, I love that the objectivity of that to some degree they do, they do eventually <laughs> when they're when they're eliminating someone they, they know who it is they're eliminating uh, but I feel like it does bring a lot more objectivity than you usually get in these shows. And everyone seems so good natured and kind to each other that <laughs> you don't get in a lot of the cooking competitions like this in the US. So I'm gonna have to look and see if there was another regional version of this because this is specifically labeled as the UK, the taste, um, because it, it's a great format. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I think that is it for my week this week <laughs> because obviously with a new cat, Despite the cat being relatively easy, that has taken some some figuring out and more energy than, than it should, really. Uh, and I think the only other thing going on this week, it was Indie Bookstore Day yesterday, and I really was intending to, to go do some stuff for that, and I did not. Uh, it was stormy here, and also with the new cat around, just was, was a very low energy time. <laughs> so, so that's been my week. Um, lots of books, though, which is a, a very positive change.
So I hope you have a wonderful week and thank you so very much for watching.